Welcome to the Tech Guys Who Invest podcast, where each week you will learn how to invest wisely and safely. On this show, you'll hear about lessons Adam and Kevin are learning on their investor journey, as well as insights from industry experts. Our vision is to educate, entertain, and bring tons of value to you. Welcome to our show. Welcome, everyone, to another episode of the Tech Guys Who Invest podcast, where each week you learn how to invest wisely and safely. This episode is an exciting one where we have the pleasure of interviewing a former IT professional like Adam and I turned real estate problem solver. There's a huge emphasis on solving problems as an investor because whenever you find a problem to solve, chances are you'll find profits too. They usually go hand in hand. Before we dive into the episode, let's learn about our guest. Author and real estate innovator, Michelle transformed her career from IT professional to full-time real estate investor. Moving from a job she was passionate about but had no control over her schedule or life, she discovered the potential of real estate investing. She was hooked. As an innovative problem solver, accomplished project manager, master connector, and fearless action taker, she navigates investing opportunities and challenges head-on. After years of experience in single homes, commercial buildings, and multifamily properties in different states, she is passionate about helping people solve real estate issues and find the freedom, wealth, and satisfaction that she enjoys. Don't forget to leave the Tech Guys Who Invest podcast a review on Apple Podcasts so that we can reach more like-minded people like yourselves and help educate more individuals about the power of investing. If you want to stay up to date with episode releases and investor insights, be sure to subscribe to the podcast at tgwipodcast.com forward slash subscribe. Without further ado, here's this week's episode. Welcome, everybody, to another episode of the Tech Guys Who Invest podcast, where each week we teach you how to invest wisely and safely. On this episode, we have Michelle Kapaska to talk about how she is a fearless innovator as well as full-time investor. Welcome, Michelle. Hi. Thank you, guys. Yeah, we're so excited to have you on. So, Michelle, uh, let's start out with something that is pretty interesting sounding. You went from IT problem solver to real estate problem solver. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Okay. The short story is I quit my job. Actually, I call it J-O-B, just over broke. (laughs) 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 However, the long story is I actually had started investing in um, 2000 and I bought my first house. My friend um, Patsy wanted to move to Charlotte to be closer to her, um, her daughter. And I said, well, I'll buy your house from you. That way you can, you know, go on about your merry way and get to Charlotte quicker. So over, that was my first year investing. I I knew nothing about investing. I totally just dove in head first, you know, And But over time, I built my portfolio um, where I was receiving enough passive income that I could quit my J-O-B in 2017. Love it. So that's something to touch on. That was, if I did my math correctly, 17 years it Mm -hmm. took you to get there. So it's not a get rich overnight type of thing. It it is something that you build up to. Can you do it faster than 17 years? Sure, absolutely. But it's something to keep in mind that if you start investing today, it's not going to happen tomorrow. Nope. So I think it definitely, it message. definitely was a long road, um, especially since uh, I knew nothing about investing. I didn't even know how to get my tenants. I didn't know how to screen them. I didn't know anything about the financial side. So I was learning on the fly, for sure. That's sometimes the best way to learn. I mean, in IT, you kind of are the same way, right? You learn <laughs> on the fly. Google can become your best friend, right? Uh, to be honest with you, <laughs> I was thrown to the wor- wolves a lot in IT. <laughs> Yes, you definitely are. Even in, I'm on the sales side and that is still the case. Right. Hey, give us this demo, you know, just out of the blue. Like, All right, I right. guess, whatever, if we have to. Um, and mom- now you're currently renting your primary residence. And you said you're, before we were hit record, you're living in the front yard. How, how is that working for you? <laughs> so um, I decided to give a shot out at doing the va- short-term v- rentals. And so I put my primary, res- I'm, it's a big house. I have a four bedroom house. It's me, I'm single. And I'm like, you know what? I can just probably rent my house out on a short term rental. And let me see what, it, see what happens. But then I'm like, okay, well, where am I going to live? Right? So I decided to pull my RV out of my garage and I'm living in the front yard in my RV. Nice. And it worked. <laughs> nice. 
<laughs> my cat, my awesome. cats were a little confused. They don't know which house to go to at night, but I think <laughs> I've got them trained now. <laughs> That's funny. Um, I, I'm curious how that works with the people who are in your house. I'm assuming they know that you'll be there on the property still. And uh, the people who rent your house just don't mind that, right? So far, everyone, I started this back in November and I have let everybody know that I am on premise and that I won't bother them. However, it doesn't necessarily turn out like that. I actually start talking to them and we hang out a little bit. <laughs> and so I've met some <laughs> great people from, a lot of people are coming from Massachusetts and Pittsburgh. So I've met a lot of people. And I just had an inquiry today from Iowa, which is where I'm from. So that was fun. <laughs> that cold weather. It's yes. starting to warm up here in Tampa. Or, you know, right. So <laughs> I think people right. are coming down here. Uh, so as far as living in your RV, what's the idea behind doing a short-term rental versus long-term if you have the ability to live somewhere else long-term? Um, I'm not sure I understand that. Like what's their thought process for deciding to do short-term versus having oh. a long-term person? Well, honestly, it's more lucrative. Uh, you know, on a monthly basis, um, I will get probably 10 times the amount of money that I would just having a long-term renter in there. And in one month, um, I don't know if we can give out numbers, but the, the one month of March, I'm booked and I'm booked solid. And at the end of the day, I'll make $8,000. Wow. Nice. What would you estimate the, the rent would be if you were to have like a full lease? 2300 a month. Wow. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. a significant difference. Right. Huge difference. Exactly. So, so I chose to Michelle, do it. <laughs> yeah, no, that's, that's really neat. So what, uh, you know, you did work in IT and um, I'm sure you're using plenty of the skills that you used in your day job to run your investing business. Can you talk to us a little bit about what you felt carried over and things that you thought were useful to them? And, you know, some of our listeners here may be thinking about doing something like this in the future and want to know what things they might be able to bring with them. Mm -hmm. So I would say I was a project manager in IT. So I managed large million dollar implementations. I had multiple vendors working with me. Um, on the team. And then I had my regular team members. And then I also had the client members reporting to me on the project. So the skills that I gained as a project manager, one would be negotiation. I was constantly negotiating, constantly, you know, there were constant daily battles and um, issues that needed to be resolved. Um, I mean, by the minute, right? Um, I was also great at conflict resolution. Um, there's also conflict within real estate. You've got to be able to talk to sellers directly and come up with solutions, you know, uh, on the fly. Problem solving was at the finest. I mean, that is my growing up in Iowa. I was groomed by my father as a problem solver. He never would solve problems for me. He would make me think. And so I was perfect for project management and ultimately it led to, you know, an entrepreneur. And then there's other skills like um, risk assessment. Yeah. Constantly um, evaluating risk and especially in real estate. Um, I bought an apartment complex, um, an eight unit apartment complex. And if I didn't, if I didn't have the risk assessment knowledge I had, I probably wouldn't have bought that property. And if I wouldn't have bought it, I wouldn't have the gain that I gained on that um, property. You wouldn't be living in your driveway right now. <laughs> no, I would not be living in my driveway right now at all. Plus, I, plus I, I built a great team around me to help me with that also. Um, and then there's also the soft skills. Um, as a project manager, I was a therapist, <laughs> many, um, I was a cat herder, <laughs> um, and those skills also transfer over to real estate because you've got to be able to, um, communicate with, with the sellers. Um, you've got to be able to communicate with your title, title team, uh, a real estate agent, if you use one. So all of those skills, in my opinion, transferred over one-to-one. -one. 100%. Everything that you mm -hmm. talked about from the problem solving to the risk assessment, the soft skills I think are, are hugely important because you're conversing with people 
whatever type of asset class it is, whether you're raising capital or you're going to be the one to find the deal, those soft skills are vital to being a successful investor. Sure. Uh, how would you recommend someone who's currently in the IT space to start investing, right? You started by, say, solving a problem, but mm -hmm. how would you recommend somebody that is in the IT space, has a full-time job and says, you know, maybe I want to start investing in real estate? Okay, I'm going to tell you what not to do. Don't do it the <laughs> way I did it, right? Um, the good thing about the way I did it is I was working full time and I purchased property um, on the side and I was able to do it. However, I didn't have the skill. I didn't have the knowledge. Right. So what I think the best answer that, to that is find someone like you, Kevin, or Adam or myself and attach yourselves to one of us and we can help you guide because we've been down this path. We know the we know the players in the field. We're able to kind of articulate the direction that you want to go. So I'm thinking if you're working in IT full time and you want to dabble, usually the people what I'm hearing from in for my IT friends is they want to start out with a rental property. Okay, great. Call me. Call Kevin. One of us can solve that problem and we can help you figure out, you know, if if flipping is your thing or is it buy and hold. And then from there we can give them some other coaching. Yeah, Love that's it. great. Yeah, I like I like that idea of um, learning from someone. It it definitely accelerates your learning and mm -hmm. will accelerate the time it takes you to get started. Um, nowadays, it's so easy to self learn, particularly with research on the internet, and um, you know you can learn a lot by yourself, but all of the nuances and the practical experience that you'll get from um, associating with someone who's done it is just mm -hmm. priceless. So I right. really like that. Um, Michelle, how did you first learn about real estate? Well, it was really, um, again, it goes back to my girlfriend. She said she, I was really trying to help her. I wanted her to be closer to her daughter. And so I found a real estate agent to help me you know, purchase her place from her. And he helped me through all the steps. Um, and ultimately he led me um, down the path of flipping. We actually used to flip together. I would, I would supply the money and he would go do the actual work. Um, however, in, in 2017, when I quit my job, I was already fully prepared to quit because I was working part-time. I had reduced my work hours down to part-time and then as soon as I quit, I knew what I was going to do. And that was, I studied underneath Robert Kiyosaki. And I studied, I was already used to sitting behind a computer all day, right? Right. So now I just said, okay, I'm going to take a class. It took me six months to get through it. And it was a coaching program. So I learned underneath him. And then once I was done with that, I said, you know what? Now I need to apply. I need to go figure out, I need to go do something. I need to make an action item. So you know what the first thing I did was? What's that? Bought something. I fired my real estate agent. <laughs> <laughs> I fired him because I wanted to make mistakes. I wanted to learn how to flip on my own. So I went and found a new real estate agent. Again, I didn't know the dynamics of what I know now. I would have never used an agent. I would have done, went directly to a seller, but so that was another mistake. So I went to another real estate agent and he helped me find a house. And once I found the house, I said, okay, um, my old real estate agent, we still remain friends. I didn't fire him. Like, you know, I said that <laughs> like that I was nice to him. And, um, so I kept him, you know, he kept helping me. He's like, Michelle, you're going to make a ton of mistakes. And I said, good, I want to learn. So, but he allowed me to use his, uh, flipping team, the guys that did all the work. And so, Again, guess what? Michelle came, became a project manager again, right? Only now it's the blue collar guys instead of white collar guys. So, um, but here's what happened. The flip became a flop. You know why? Why? I bought the property at too high of a price. I put too much money into it. And when I went to sell it, it wouldn't sell. Oh, the man. Price, the price actually dropped $10,000 in a week. My Oof. agent calls me up and he says, Michelle, I don't know what happened, but something happened in your neighborhood. And I said, I'll tell you what happened in the neighborhood. I said, did you see that guy on TV that killed his wife and buried her in the backyard? I said, that was six blocks from my house. 
So My nobody goodness. wanted nobody wanted to buy. But it really it technically it wasn't a flip that turned into a flop because those those uh, renters became my buyers and I am now have uh, a seller financing agreement with them. So it really didn't turn into a flop, but it sounded good. <laughs> <laughs> it's a flop in one way, but then right. you see the problem within yourself, your situation say, okay, how can I solve this? Right. So I right. totally love that. And you're talking about it, from what I'm gathering and from what I know of you uh, for a little bit of background, Michelle and I are friends. And, but I love her story and I wanted to have her on the show. Her favorite thing to tell me is she loves to make mistakes because that's the way she learns. And as yeah. you're gathering from this episode, that's exactly how she learns best. So I wanted to ask yeah. you, what would you say is your favorite investing mistake or one that you learned the most oh. from? Oh, that is going to be the eight unit um, apartment complex that I bought. So Michelle thought it was really, I used, I, um, I would always write down my goals every year. And I think back in 2007, I wrote on my goals list that I wanted commercial real estate. I didn't really know what that meant, but I just wanted to check the box. You know, project managers, we like to check the box all the time. So after I purchased the first little flip that flopped, um, the real estate agent came up to me and he says, Michelle, didn't you tell me you were interested in commercial? And I'm like, yeah, I am. He goes, hey, I got one. I said, okay, well, what is it? Well, it was an eight unit apartment complex. And I said, okay, let's go look at it. So I got, they let me meet with the sellers, which I thought was great. Um, but here lies the problem. The eight unit apartment complex was on um, a waterfront, um, like a little inlet. Mm -hmm. And when you could physically see inside the building that there was water damage, not Oof. only water damage, but seawall water damage. Um, the cracks were this thick and you could wow. see, right? Well, I knew that if I got an inspection, I could find out what's wrong. The sellers told me they had gotten um, an estimate to com you know, figure out what the cost was to complete it. And so it didn't scare me because it had a solution, right? And I like solutions. Well, after the inspection, I learned that the eight air conditioning units were 28 years old. And I'm like, I'm surprised they're still living, right? So 28 years old, 28, and they were still kicking. It was great. That's amazing, really. They don't look like that anymore. No, they don't. Yeah. <laughs> However, before closing, one of them, one of them died, and the seller did have to replace it. But I used the the gap in the seawall and the the air conditioning units, and there was one other issue that I don't recall right now. But I used those as negotiating tools um, to go back and negotiate the price. So it took, I think we went back and forth at the end of the day, probably four times. And so I bought this property um, at a lower price. Uh, then my goal was to go into each unit and bring them up to, you know, um, rehab um, the inside of them, which I did. Right. My next goal was to, as move, as renters moved out, I would increase the rents to make it, you know, more viable for um, a future person that would maybe want to purchase it from me. So I got halfway through the year and I learned some other lessons. One, the seller didn't tell me exactly everything about the property. He didn't tell me that I was also responsible for paying water and sewer. Well, that bill alone and some electric. And so that right there, that cut into my profits about $800 a month. Didn't know that, didn't count on that, didn't calculate that when I was working on it. So fast forward, now I'm starting to learn that where this property was located, I was limited in the amount of rent that I could raise it because of the workforce. The workforce in this area was basically restaurant and bar workers. So I was strapped. So I thought, well, you know what? Halfway through the year, I'm thinking I'll just, I'll sell it. Well, I tried to sell it initially by myself and um, I, didn't, I didn't do a good job. So I happened to be down playing the cash flow game with you, Kevin. I think that's Ooh. how I met you. <laughs> and uh, I, you go around the room, introduce yourself and say, hey, I'm Michelle and I've got an eight unit apartment complex for sale. And there's a guy in the blue shirt in the back of the room and he stands up and he says, I want to talk to you uh, after the game. I said, all right. 
Well, that guy happened to be Tyler Chef. And so I didn't know who Tyler was. I had no clue who Tyler was. But I knew that he was getting a lot of attention after the show, you know, after the game. And I was like, who, who is this guy? Who does he think he is? So <laughs> I, walk, <laughs> I walk up to him and I said, hi, I'm Michelle. I said, I'm the girl. I said, you wanted to see my apartment complex? And he says, yeah, I do. And I, he goes, tell me about it. I said, well, it's in Hudson. It's on the water. And he goes, oh, I don't want it. And I'm like, what do you mean you don't want it? He goes, didn't you just tell me it's on the water? I'm like, yeah. He goes, well, don't you pay flood insurance? I'm like, yeah, it's like $3,500 a year. He goes, yeah, I don't want it. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, well, this guy's obviously got criteria. I need to know more <laughs> about why, you know, I should have. I should have done that when I was doing my evaluation. So I said, I kept asking questions and they were, if I didn't have a backbone, he would have chewed me up and spit me out. And I'm like, Oh no, I'm not getting chewed. Up. I'm going to sit here and I'm going to take the punches. And he did he kept <laughs> rolling them. And so then he goes, you know what? You get on my calendar and I'm going to, uh, I want to come up and see the property, but I want to talk to you about the numbers first. So we got on a call talked to him. And then he and his wife, Jill met me at the property and initially didn't know this then, but they were evaluating it if they wanted to purchase it, but it didn't fit their criteria. But the other thing Tyler was, he was also a real estate agent and a darn good one, by the way. And he and I and Jill sat for three hours and we talked about it. And he said to me, this is what he said. He didn't guarantee anything because you can't do that as a real estate agent. But he did say, I'm going to get you 650000 on this or more. I didn't tell you what I paid for it, but at the end of the day, uh, he MLS did not sell this property. He sold this using social marketing, social media. And the buyer that came to the table, his wife actually, um, his grand, her grandfather owned the building before in 1980, and it became an emotional purchase. And so that's how we sold it was to them. Wow. Right. What a cool story. But, but I feel like that was like my worst nightmare. Right. But it, what I did is I surrounded myself with great people that, you know, helped me along the way really is what that's, what that's about. What are, what are some big lessons you learned? I feel like there are probably a, a large number of lessons you learned in that whole thing. Are, are there any though that, that really stand out to you? That, that you think to yourself, I really took this away from that whole experience. The biggest lesson, like I just mentioned, is surround yourself with people that have more knowledge than yourself. Number yeah, one. That's great. About the property specifically, the one thing that Tyler made me think about was um, the flood insurance. That really yeah. cut That really cut into your profits. And I'm like, oh, yeah, I'm not doing that again. So those are the biggest, the two biggest takeaways, but I learned a lot <laughs> on that one. <laughs> yeah, it sounds like it. And Michelle, it sounds like you have a, uh, a higher threshold of accepting fear when going into something. I mean, you, mm -hmm. you have a great attitude about it, it sounds like, where you're ready to learn and, and it doesn't really scare you as much as it does others. But I know fear is the number one thing holding most people back. And we have a lot of people who listen to the show who are IT engineers, mm -hmm. high, high net worth people who are successful in their own areas. And um, they don't like failing. They don't like making mistakes and therefore fear holds them back. What might you say to someone like that to help them get over that hump because I, I'd, we'd love to see more people kind of take their financial future into their own hands and mm -hmm. make that first investment. Do you know where the most successful people are? They're on the other side of fear. You have to jump over that hurdle. And I think what makes me a little different and unique in that area is that I grew up with a father that never showed me fear. And it wasn't until I went to write my book that I started researching. And then I realized that I grew up with, since I grew up with a father that had no fear, I've lived my life with, with no fear. I just do things. I've jumped out of a plane. I waterfall repelled. I ride a motorcycle. I'll do anything. <laughs> I don't care. Um, because when I get to the other side, there's like this whole new world that opens up. 
So, and fear is made up in our minds. If, if you give yourself five seconds to think about fear, you've just talked yourself out of it. So don't just, like you've, got to, you've got to react and just do it. That's it. <laughs> yeah, totally agree. I love that, that, that mentality. And that's a big point. You have that, that reference point with your, your upbringing. You didn't really think about fear growing up. So as you're an adult, mm -hmm. it's like, okay, if this doesn't really scare me, so let me just go ahead and do it. Right. I didn't even know. Actually, it was kind of a deficit for me too, because I didn't have the soft skills around me because growing up on a farm, everything we, we talked direct and it, it, every word meant something. So it wasn't until I got into college that I learned, oh my gosh, I have to really soften <laughs> the way that I'm talking to people because they're taking me wrong. And I'm like, this is, that's not me. That's not me. So I had to learn, you know, the soft part of me. But um, again, those skills, I, I have a, I lead a motorcycle group. Well, guess who's in the group? All men, <laughs> right? And I'm the leader and they love it and they love it. And I can, I can tell them, I can control them and say, this is how we're going to ride. This is how we're going to do it. And if you step outside that zone, I will come get you. <laughs> and they don't mess with me. Michelle. No, That's don't right. mess with me. <laughs> I love it. So Michelle, on your website, you talk about, you know, you can solve these financial and real estate problems and, you know, from your experience and what you've done so far, I believe that, what would you say are the most common financial or real estate problems you see as an investor? Here, it's probably not going to be what you're, you think I'm going to say, right? It's about the sellers. Sellers are led to believe that there's only one way to sell a house. And that's using a real estate agent. Well, I'm not an agent. I don't even want to be an agent because I have great agents around me, but to get a seller to talk to someone directly, that's just a girl that just wants to solve a problem is a little more challenging. But once I get a hold of them and, and start talking to them, then they understand I do have investor attached to my name and that scares people. They think, Oh, you're just a shyster and you're just going to take my money. Nope. No, no, no. I'm going to solve a problem. I'm going to get to the core of what your issue is regarding real estate. And then I'm going to craft and create a win-win solution for both of us. I'll give you an example. I bought, well, let me take that back. I, uh, my sister lives in Arkansas and she told me about a house um, two doors down from her that wasn't selling. And I said, well, what kind of house is it? Tell me about, you know, tell me about it. And she said, well, it's a modular home and it's had three contracts and it's under contract again. And I said, okay. I said, um, do you know the, do you know the sellers? And she said, yeah, I do. I said, well, give them my phone number and have them call me. I said, but I don't want to talk to them until they're done with the contracts. Cause I don't want to get in trouble with a real estate agent. I said, but have them call me when it falls through. So they did. And so I, I listened to the husband and he told me what his issue was. There were two of them. One, he couldn't understand why his house wasn't selling because it was great. It looked fabulous on the inside and it was on a nice piece of property overlooking a lake and he couldn't understand. So I explained to him the reason that his house wasn't selling was because the buyers that were coming in weren't qualifying for um, a mortgage because it was a modular home. And I said, the only people that can help you would be someone like myself. And he said, well, what does that mean? And I said, well, so I talked to him a few more minutes and I found out that he and his wife were actually divorced and they just wanted to be done with each other and they wanted to be done with the house. So that was their problem. So I said, okay, in the event, it sounds like you all both want to walk away with a little bit of cash. And he goes, yes, we would like some money to walk away. And so I said, well, in the event that I could give you cash, would you mind if I take the house contract for deed, which means the, the, um, the uh, mortgage will still stay with them at, at, until which time I could pay it off, which I told them I could pay it off within three months. So I gave them both $5,000 at closing they walked away happy and I ended up with the house. 
And within three months, I was able to get the house paid off. And my, that house then became um, a buy and hold property for me. And they loved it. The solution. I mean, everybody was happy. They got what they wanted and I got what I wanted. So I heard a few things in there that not everyone listening may have picked up on, but the first one was you found that uh, opportunity as a result of a friend telling you about something and you, mm -hmm. and you're just obviously open to receiving new opportunities. Correct. So your ears perked up where someone else may have just heard someone talking about the issue, right? Right. And then when you talk to the actual seller, you were trying to find out what the real problem was and you were actually listening. You weren't thinking about, well, I need to get it for this or else it no. won't profit me. And this, you know, you were like, what is their problem? That's what you were listening for. Yep. I then you put to together something to solve it. Yep. Yeah. That's exactly that's what I did. Fantastic. And I think that's the way a lot and maybe all <laughs> creative real estate deals are done. So that that's awesome, Michelle. And then and would you say that's how you find most of your problems? How, how do you find those problems that you solve most often? So this is probably not going to be what you think it is either. But <laughs> um, have you ever been to a coffee shop and overheard conversations? Oh, yeah. Yep. Okay. How many of those conversations do you hear that are real estate related? <clears throat> I have heard them. I, I've a heard. A lot. A lot. Yeah. Yeah. So the Snoopy little Michelle will walk over and say, Hey, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to, you know, barge into your conversation, but I, I heard that you might have an issue with real estate. Um, in this, in this case, it was a divorce and they said, yeah. And, and who are you? You know, <laughs> so I kind of wiggle my way in. I use my soft skills. Remember that therapist kind of girl <laughs> and I use my soft skills and I wiggle in. It actually happened today. I went to Goodyear today to um, take my truck in to get um, the oil changed. And the one guy, Nate, he was like, so Michelle, what are you up to? So I told him, I said, oh, I'm renting out my house. I'm living in the front yard. And he said, you know, I've been thinking about that. How, do, how, how can I rent out a room and, and whatnot? And so those conversations just lead to other conversations. But here's the kicker. Guess how many people were listening to me in the background? There was a oh, sheriff's man. officer listening to me. Another guy that was over at the register came over and he started talking to me. And so it just snowballs from there, right? So geez. So you there's a couple of things there, right? You're you're being nosy is one. <laughs> but <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but you're also not afraid to kind of interject to see that say that you have the confidence to help somebody out, right? Right. There's that fear of rejection, like, well, they probably won't want to talk to me, but you kind right. of look at it from the perspective of, oh, I hear a problem. I can solve that problem. And that's how you approach it. That's a very uh, mature mindset of looking at things and a great way to find deals. And right. where's the competition there? It, because you kind of put yourself at the right place at the right time. And right. if you're constantly looking for those types of things, you're kind of uh, taking away the competition that exists. Right. And yeah, speaking my... of that, oh, sorry, yeah. go ahead. No, that's fine. Go ahead. I was going to ask, when it comes to real estate investing, there are a lot of people that focus on a particular niche. And we even will preach that you need to find something to focus on. And for what it sounds like, you haven't really picked an asset class per se, but rather you focused on the path of solving problems. Why, why do you think that that is? Or what is your thought process behind that? Because I'm great at it. I mean, that's the short answer. <laughs> Meaning because I'm such a problem solver and I've developed that skill over time, I don't care what asset class you're in. I don't care if it's a single family home. I don't care if it's multifamily, if it's commercial, the problem is the problem doesn't change. You still have a problem. I can still solve the problem. And so therefore, if it's a modular home, I can solve the modular home. And tomorrow I'm actually going to an RV park up in Cedar Key. So I'm, and that girl has actually deterred me from coming. She went to my website and found out I'm an investor today. And she replied back, Michelle, I'm, I'm not sure that uh, I don't want to, I don't want to deter you from coming. And I said, Oh no, I'm coming. I'll see you tomorrow because I want to <laughs> learn. I want to learn what their problem is. Right. Nice. Right. I love it. Play to your strengths. And, <laughs> right. and that's when exactly. you're exactly 
So Michelle, you mentioned your book earlier. I, I'd love for you to tell us a little bit about that. Um, you wrote a book recently. I did. Can you tell us about it? I didn't like writing a book. <laughs> that, <laughs> that, that, that wasn't, that's not in my skill set. So, but I knew I had a message to get out and I wanted to get it out. And my sister actually encouraged me to do it. And um, the book is called Why My Job Quit Me, Jumpstart Your Firing, right? So it took me a while to get the pages and in, in the way the, the book was going to be laid out. But essentially, it's about all the lessons I learned growing up on a farm, how I applied them to my IT world, and how it ultimately led me to become an entrepreneur um, in real estate investing. So it's a book about inspiration, education, and there's entertainment in there too. <laughs> nice. And so what was harder, writing the book or investing in real estate? Writing the book. <laughs> <laughs> Not playing real to the strengths. <laughs> right. Real estate has key ingredients. Um, and when you follow that recipe, um, the result over time creates financial wealth and ultimately leads you to freedom. And it's more, it's very... So unlike the stock market, you have in the stock market, you have no control over what your stock is doing. But in real estate, I have full control. As long as I'm educated and I know what I'm doing, it should end up profitable. There you go. Amen to that. Now, we wouldn't be the tech guys who invest if we didn't ask you a tech question. It won't be super technical, but we would love to know what your favorite piece of tech was that you had worked with during your IT career. You mean um, an application? <laughs> I think just like a tech person to ask good. that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> it could be hardware. Uh, I it mean, could be, yeah, yeah, it could be any piece of tech. Fine. Wow. I'm not sure, but you, you might have stumped me on this one. <laughs> uh, because as a project manager, I didn't get my fingers dirty. <laughs> that skill was left to somebody else, right? Um, I guess I could say globally, the technology that we implemented overall, which was an accounting software, um, we provided a financial service and you know, we implemented a, a, an accounting solution to the company that we were working for. I actually worked for Hart here in, in Tampa, which is the bus company. And that was a three-year engagement. And at the end of the day, then they had a fully implemented um, financial system. So um, I, don't, I don't know if that answered your question, but if you're looking for something like, um, you know, I, I don't, I don't know. I don't. What about with your RV? I would love to know if you have Ooh. any cool thing on your RV that you just love. I have a Wi-Fi extender. Ooh, nice. <laughs> because the Wi-Fi is in my house and it, I can't get Wi-Fi out to my <laughs> RV. So I had to get an extender to repeat the signal so that I could work out of my RV. But, awesome. today, but today I'm working in my um, biker bar. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. For the for those watching on YouTube, you'll see uh, you'll see her background and and know what she's talking about there. It looks yeah. like a, a cool little bar there. Yeah. Um, so All she's Michelle, missing is the drink in hand. <laughs> <laughs> it's water. No, we, no, there you go. There you go. Um. For those who may want to reach out to you and uh, and just connect with you, what's the best way to do that, Michelle? Okay, so we had to come up with um, a different link because my name is spelled entirely. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's Michelle spelled funny and then nobody could spell it. So the best way to reach out to me is to go to fearlessinnovator.com. And there's a contact page there and you can reach out to me there. And there's other links on there as well. Um, I actually host a, a, what I call the innovation Roundtable, And that is a weekly, I'm sorry, it's a, the third Tuesday of the month and I host it um, via zoom and it's anything and everything you want to learn about uh, real estate. And so we talk about anything real estate there. It's a networking opportunity for anybody that wants to join. Awesome. And they can, they can find out about that on fearlessinnovator.com as well. Yep. Everything's there. That, th that piece. Awesome. Yep, All right. Well, Michelle, thanks. Thanks again for coming on. It's been great having you on. We really appreciate it. Awesome. Nice to meet you, Adam. Thank you. 
Thank you so much for listening to this week's episode. Be sure to subscribe to the podcast for the latest episode updates and to receive investor insights to help you invest wisely and safely. You can join the TGWI Insiders community at tgwipodcast.com forward slash subscribe. Don't forget to leave us a review on Apple Podcasts. The feedback helps us grow and helps us give you the best investing content out there. For a step-by-step guide on how to leave a review, head over to tgwipodcast.com forward slash review. And lastly, we'd love to connect with you. The best way to reach us is by sending us an email at techguyswhoinvest at gmail.com.